Please bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you that you have set Jesus over all things and you have made him the head of us, your church, that in you is all fullness, all goodness, all glory, and all grace. Father, this morning I pray that your spirit would tune our hearts to sing the praise of that goodness that is you. That we might so be changed and transformed by the hearing of the gospel and that we would cling to you and to nothing else. Father, that image of having the dust shaken off of your shoes is a riveting one. Lord, we pray that that would never be true in our lives, that we would invite you in and hear from you and sup with you and be changed by you every single day. And that there would never be anything in our lives that would prevent us from being near you. So, Lord, give us your courage, your strength, your spirit, that we might shrug off the sins that cling close, closely and run the race that's set before us, that we might be with you. Lord, I pray this morning that every word of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room and watching online would be pleasing and acceptable to you as we depend upon you as our only rock and only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So some of you know that my in-laws have a tiny little lake house just north of Lynn Haven, Florida, and that's where we spent most of uh, Independence Day weekend. And one of the highlights of the weekend was when my sister-in-law would wake us up every morning with extremely loud army bugle calls. Now, Vickery doesn't actually play the bugle. She had one of those big stereo things. It's called a block rocker, and uh, it rocks loudly. She would come into the bunk room and wake us up with first call, right? We would all sit bolt upright, and a few minutes after we've had a chance to brush our teeth, we would hear Reveille, you know, um, we would all run to the flagpole, and that would be the music by which we raised the American flag. And it was not a highlight, it was a low light, let's be honest. But um, <laughs> as bleary-eyed as I was, it was so special to watch Ebed and Zeke and his, their cousins unfold that flag carefully and raise it to the sound of that annoying bugle. Uh, before pledging allegiance not only to the flag, but also to the Bible. Do y'all remember that one from Vacation Bible School? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Join me if you know it, and I will hide my words in my heart that I might not sin against God, right? So we learned that one, and it was a joyous day. We'd run off to swim and play and celebrate our nation's independence over wicked old England. Um, but as much as uh, these were special moments, I really enjoyed the end of the day when you'd hear call to quarters and taps closing out each day. I've never seen my boys so dutifully excited to go to bed every night. Well, Independence Day, as you know, fell on a Sunday this year, and that seemed to set at odds two starkly different ideas. The idea of human independence on the one hand and our call to be radically dependent upon God on the other. Those who are called into God's kingdom are called to be obedient to his word and his spirit and to set his rule over our desire for self-rule. We're called to see our desire for self-rule as sin and to cling to him and not to ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong, I love to grill out and fly the flag and shoot fireworks to celebrate the beginnings of America, a nation that rightly won its independence over the unjust government of King George III. But remember that at our best, we wanted our independence so that we could become dependent on one another and to the rule of law and to the idea of government for the people and by the people, and ideally, to form a sort of earthly rule that would allow each citizen the freedom to become dependent on God. 
But like every nation on earth, America is made up of a bunch of humans. And so, my friends, we are full of sinners, and we wrestle, and our nation struggles with the wrestling. Our churches struggle with the wrestling of that desire, that fleshly desire we all have to make our own way, to determine our own future, to satisfy our own appetites, rather than to do what we were created to do, which is to cling to the God who made us and redeemed us by the blood of Jesus on the cross. I read an article this week entitled, Happy Radical Dependence on God Day. And it was about how jarring Independence Day and our duty to worship God can be when they happen on the same day. I like that title for every day of our lives, for that is what every day of our lives should be, a day when we radically depend upon God. We use our independence, our freedom, to choose to order our lives after what God calls us to in his word. We live in a world, as you might agree, I know, about as different as that as can be. We are fiercely independent in the West. We're radically free to say what we want to say, to be who we want to be, to gender ourselves as we want to be gendered. All the list of staggering claims to human independence goes on and on. What might it look like if we, as the church in America, remember that we've been set free, we've been made independent so that we can become servants of God? Today, as we turn to God's word, that is the question that we must ask ourselves. Am I radically independent and free to make my own way in the world? Or am I radically dependent on God? If we're to answer this question, Paul's words from the letter to the Ephesians is a great place to start. Mark Wilkerson did a great job capturing some of the rhythm of this reading. If you read it in Greek, from verse 3 to verse 23 is one breathless sentence. No pauses, no breaks. We, uh, in English, have to put a comma every now and then to catch ourselves, or a period to gather our thoughts before we launch back in. But... For Paul, and even with those breaks in English, these words, they have this rhythm, this, this energy, this bubbling over joy about what God has done. The words leave us in awestruck wonder at what God has done for us. Every bit of good news in Ephesians 1 is about what God has done. Nothing at all about what we have done from our own wills and in our own freedom and independence. Nothing in Ephesians 3 is about what we have managed. It is what God has done. Blessed be God. He has blessed you and blessed me with every spiritual blessing. He has blessed us with blessings that are cosmic in scope. He's blessed us with blessings that are beyond the bounds of time and created space. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you. He chose me. He adopted us as sons and daughters by his will through the beloved. And all that is good in you and all that is good in me is what we find in him. In him, we have redemption by the blood of Jesus. In him, we are holy and blameless. In him, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. In him, we are gods forever and ever. In him, we know knowledge and wisdom. In him, the eyes of our hearts are enlightened that we would know the hope and the riches and the glory and the greatness that can be ours only in Christ. Blessed be God indeed, for he has lavished on you and he has lavished on me the riches of his grace. Amen? Amen. When I read these 23 verses, I'm just left somewhat bewildered by my own willful, foolish heart. Why would I want to be independent from this story of glory and grace? My foolish longing to make my own way in the world. Why would I put myself under any other rule 
than the one of this God of love and mercy? How is it that I can convince myself in a, in a split second that I'm in charge, that my sins don't matter, that my disobedience is unimportant, that my relationship with God is just one small part of my otherwise quite full life? This is the question that we must ask ourselves. Am I independent and free to make my own way in the world, or am I radically dependent on God? The God described here in Ephesians is the only one that can bless us. He's the only source of our existence. He's the only source of hope for us. And Paul tells us that life in his church, in the church that is his body, is the only place where we can know the fullness of life. Faced with these glorious truths that are an invitation to us to move into relationship with God, will we surrender our independence and become dependent upon him? In Amos we remember that the decision between dependence on God and independence to make our own way is a life or death decision. God draws a line in the sand. He sets a plumb line by which humans are to measure their lives. The land of Israel, the northern kingdom, had declared independence from the Lord's rule, and the fruit of that independence was evil idolatry, injustice, a lack of care for the poor, the belief that if we could just get the worship right in the temple at Bethel, then we would keep God's judgment at bay. Through Amos, God says that even his chosen people will be judged if they choose to live immoral lives. For those who declare independence from God's rule will find their high places desolate and their sanctuaries laid waste. The things we cling to for meaning are meaningless unless God is at the heart of them. Will we surrender our independence and choose to depend upon him? In both our gospel lesson and the psalm we read today, we hear a word of hope that connects that judgment we read about in Amos to the joy that Paul breathlessly recounts in Ephesians 1. In Mark, we see Jesus sending the 12 out to preach, and Jesus calls them to this radical dependence on him. He says, don't take any bread, don't take a bag, don't take any money, just trust my authority, says Jesus, and you'll see the gospel change lives. Jesus used these flawed men and did radical work through them. All they had to do was trust in him and not in themselves. And in Psalm 85, we remember the faithfulness of God who continues to work even in light of human sin and disobedience. We offend, but he forgives. He judges sin, but he loves us sinners. He shows mercy, and he grants salvation. Those who fear him, who surrender their independence and depend on him, will know his mercy and his peace. My friends, Jesus has sent you out into the world to share the good news, that God's reign over us is our only hope of living the good life. And he may be sending you with no bag, and no money, and no bread. He may be asking you to, to depend upon him and not on yourself. And you're going to have to figure out what that looks like in your life. What is he calling you to give up to depend upon him? And will we go relying on the resources that he gives us to do the work? Because he calls every one of us to go. You're all sent into the world to bear the good news. Will we surrender our own self-rule and depend on him and do what he asks us to do? 
You know, sometimes your phone will out of nowhere just blast some alert to you. You know, it's an amber alert or a silver alert or there's a tornado coming down your street. Like something, your phone just screams at you. I wish our phones would give us a bugle call every morning and evening. You know, something new. Maybe Thomas could write it and Adam McLeod could blast it to us. And just a call to stop. Just to stop for a minute and remember what God has called us to. To stop and ask God to forgive us for that desire in us for self-rule and to fill us with His Spirit. A bugle call to stop running our own lives and surrender ourselves to the reign of His kingdom, which is the source of love and justice. All we have to do is look around and see what human independence gets us. Left to raw human freedom, we humans are self-centered and angry and confused and aimless and rudderless. Every rabbit hole we run down just opens up into more options to sin against the God who created all things and redeems all things. Put another way, as soon as we get what we want through the exercise of our free will, we just want more. Because nothing can satisfy us but God. And my friends, we can only have God when we surrender our own wills to his rule and become radically dependent on him. Now around your tables today and on your knees tonight, talk to one another and to God and ask, what does it look like to be fiercely dependent on God? Not just on Sunday mornings, but every day of our lives. Now, I rejoice that I live in a country where I am free and I am independent. And I'm thankful for those who've laid down their lives to make that true and possible. But what I do with that freedom is up to me. And the call on our lives is to remember that we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and that's a blessing. But may we exercise that freedom to find freedom in Christ, freedom from sin, freedom from death, free to be who he's called us to be. And may we be brave enough to show the world around us that true freedom can only be found by those who surrender their lives to the reign of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.